We are going to be talking about freedom and food, redemption and raisins from Hosea chapter 3. So if you have a Bible and want to turn there, that's what we're going to be reading. It's in the Old Testament. Now Jesus, when he came, he came as a preacher. And he came preaching a message, first of all, of repentance. He said, repent because God's kingdom has come near. In other words, to stop everything, drop everything, sort your life out. God has come near to us. When Jesus came saying, repent, he wasn't saying, start saying sorry for everything all the time. Instead, he was offering a more relational thing. God has come near. And another word than the word repent, that perhaps is a bit more relational, is the word return. Jesus came saying, return, return to God. And that's the message of Hosea, the Old Testament prophetic book. It's um, a word that appears in almost every chapter of the book, return. He's calling the people to return, return to their God, return over and over again for 14 chapters. But God, of course, doesn't just deal in words, but in actions. He doesn't just tell a people to return. He calls a prophet, Hosea, to embody and enact his love for his people. And so he tells Hosea to marry a woman that he knows full well is going to be unfaithful to him. And this woman, his wife, then has several adulterous relationships. And each time God says to Hosea, go back to her, have her back, love her again, as a way of saying, this is how I love your people. This is how I love my people. I go back, return to me, the lover of my people, the lover of our souls. The Christian message, the gospel, is essentially a message calling people to return. Return to God. And we want to help you find your way back to God, wherever you are. But what do you do when you can't return and you feel stuck? You've run out of money in a distant land. You're away from home. How do you get back? How do you return? Maybe you're a prisoner or a slave. You are literally captive. You can't return even if you wanted to. As a child, I watched the film Hook a lot. I don't know if you've seen that film. It was a staple in my household growing up. We watched that over and over again. In fact, I could probably do, you know, recite the script for you now. Um, in the film Hook, Peter Pan has grown up. And Captain Hook captures Peter Pan's children and takes them to Neverland. And then in one of the opening scenes in Neverland... Peter Pan, the old man, has to try to free Jack from a net. And he climbs the rigging on a pirate ship and reaches out his hand to Cat to grab him, but he can't. And Jack says to his dad, he says, Dad, I want to go home. But his dad is powerless to save him. Those words, I want to go home, sum up the feeling of return. I want to go home. When was the last time you said those words? just want to get home. Maybe you're out late, transport links were rubbish, Southern Rail were letting you down. I just want to get home. I found myself saying those words this past week. I climbed a cliff or a steep hill, but I prefer cliff. A steep hill, a cliff in Dorset. And um, it was right on the edge. There was no fence. It was right on the edge um, of a sandstone cliff that was quite notoriously crumbly. And at one point, I had no choice but to go within a yard a foot, an inch of the edge and peer over the edge. And I hate heights at the best of time. And I found myself saying, I just want to go home. <laughs> but I can't, I've got to keep going. It was only when we got to the bottom that we saw a sign that said no trespassing. And I realized I'm a trespasser and I didn't know it. I want to go home. But let's come back to God together. God is our home. He's the one you were made to know and to be in friendship with. And rather than just talk about it, we're going to do it. You know, I was struck, I, was, I read about um, a pastor in New York, Rich Velodas, in his book, A Deeply Formed Life. He said one Sunday they had a visiting speaker, uh, a monk who devoted himself to a life of solitude and silence. And the monk in the, in the church auditorium, he loved it. He looked like he was loving it. He was taking photos of everything. He was smiling, talking to people. And then he took Rich to one side in a, in a public auditorium and started rebuking him quite loudly in front of all of his congregation. And he said to him this, 
He said, you all sang about being still and knowing that God is God. That's great. But why don't you practice what you sing? Why don't you ever take a moment to be still? It's easy to talk about having a relationship and friendship with God. But why don't we practice what we preach? We're here to draw near to him. So let's take a moment. Let's take a beat. We're going to put a prayer up on the screen. And let's use this before we read the scripture to draw near to God. Let's read together. Father, please free me, please save me, and please know me. We're here for you, Father. We want to know you. We didn't come for religion. We didn't come for ritual. We came for you. Hosea chapter 3. And Yahweh said to me, this is the prophet Hosea speaking, Yahweh said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as Yahweh loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel, they shall dwell many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to Yahweh and to his goodness in all the latter days. This is the word of God. Now, as I read this through... Um, in preparation for this morning, there's two ideas and two things that really jarred with me, stood out and jumped out. And we're going to use those two things as kind of the, to form the, the structure and the basis of this morning's message. But in the prayer meeting, I felt the Lord say, don't just preach this, pray this. So we're going to do this. I'm going to preach for a bit, then we're going to pray. We're going to get the band up, we're going to sing, we're going to respond. I'm going to preach a bit more, and then we're going to have communion. That's the idea. That's the structure of what we're looking at. Because sometimes you can't come home. Sometimes you're stuck. Or you're trapped. You know, there's little more miserable than being guilty, realizing you need forgiveness and help, but being stuck and trapped. This is the experience of Goma, Hosea's wife. She's married to Hosea, but she's had multiple affairs, and she's even had children of uncertain paternity, and now the adulterous relationship that she's in is one of slavery. She's trapped. And that's the jarring or kind of odd idea that stands out first of all. The idea and the, the thing, as we read it, you thought, is he buying his wife? What's that about? This is what it says. Let's put it on the screen. He says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. Aha, some might say. See? Women have long been treated like possessions by men. And here's an example in the Bible. Well, no, that's not what's happening. Scholar H.W. Wolf points out that the items listed here add up to approximately 30 shekels, which is a currency. It was the price that was set in the Old Testament, the Old Testament law for the purchasing of a slave, the redeeming of a slave. We're not told why his wife needs buying back. But the price that's on her head indicates that she's become a slave of another man. Maybe she became indebted to him. Maybe she sold herself to him. And she was therefore, for whatever reason, now stuck. I want to go home, she may have said. But she couldn't. She was stuck. She was trapped. And I want us to feel the force of her predicament. What could she do? What should she do? Remember how you felt as a child when you did something stupid, you got in trouble for something, and you got banished to your room or whatever creative punishment your parents drew up for you, grounded, you weren't allowed to leave the house. These days it would be no devices. But these days if I'm telling my children off, it's get out the house. <laughs> whatever it is, you're there and you find yourself thinking, oh, I wish I could go back in time. <laughs> And not do the thing I did. I wish I could undo it. But of course you couldn't. Whatever it was you did, you're stuck with the consequences of the thing. And sometimes it's that. It's, it's only a split second 
action. Maybe you push life too hard for too long and you're burnt out. You're tired. You're lonely. So you fall asleep at the wheel. Or you text that person you know you shouldn't have done. Or you click on that website you know you shouldn't. Or you think, well, everyone else is asleep. I'm sure I can get away with watching this. Maybe you place a bet when you know you shouldn't. Or you buy something you know you can't afford and you're now in debt. Or maybe you just lash out verbally. You say something you regret. You work more hours than you know you should have done. And it's done. You're now stuck with the consequences of whatever your actions were. Are you stuck this morning? What do you do that you wish you didn't do, that you keep on doing and you can't help but do and you feel done by it? You're stuck. Many of us feel trapped in a cycle of negative thought patterns where over and over and over again we condemn ourselves or we tell ourselves, shut up, no one cares what you think. You don't belong here. No one notices if you're not around. Just stuck thinking those things. Recently I was with a friend and we took a video that she appeared in. And when we watched the video back together, she looked at herself and she said, I look like a sack of spuds. And I thought, you'd never say that about someone else. Why are you saying it about yourself? Truth is she probably didn't know. She just stuck. That's probably how she often speaks about herself. Why did Goma go to this man? Well, we're told elsewhere it was for what she believed this man could give her. She went for help. She went to alleviate some loneliness or some perceived need in her own. But now she's a slave to the one that she went to. Some of you, some of us, are trapped by the very things that we go to for help. So I go to my anger. Because anger helps me deal with the sense of powerlessness I feel. It makes me de- helps me deal with my sadness. But pretty soon, anger is always there. Always bubbling under the surface. I'm enslaved to it. Or so you go to drink or you go to porn. Because you're restless or you're bored and you're lonely. And you wake up with a steaming hangover. And you tell yourself, never again. And you mean it. Until the memory fades. Someone offers you a drink, or the craving kicks in, or you just realize my broken heart is still here, and maybe it will help this time, and so you go back. You're trapped by the thing you turn to for help. What can be done to, to help slaves? Slaves can't do much. They can try and make their lives a little bit easier by trying to placate their slave master. I'll give him what he wants, just enough so he doesn't get angry, just enough so that my misery is alleviated. Or I'll watch just long enough that my eyes see what they want to see and then I'll turn it off. And you think, I can, I can just dabble in this for so long. I'll gossip a little because it, it scratches that itch in my soul for knowledge and power. And then it's gone. The trouble is though, you're still a slave. You're not actually free. You keep returning to it. This is what, many of us know loved ones like this. We look at them and think, why don't you change what you're doing? They can't. They're trapped. They're slaves. C.S. Lewis, in his brilliant book, The Screwtape Letters, he pictures the situation of a a senior devil writing to a junior devil, teaching him about how to tempt the human race. In his writings, he calls calls God the enemy and he calls Satan our father. And he says this, he says, here's the strategy. Offer them an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. That's the formula. It is more certain and it is better style to get the man's soul and give him nothing in return. That is what really gladdens our father's heart. What can be done? What does Hosea do? He just says four short words. So I bought her. And she was a slave no longer, but a wife again. He redeemed her. And when you're a slave, that's your only hope. When you're a slave, that's your only hope, that someone would redeem you. You cannot work your way out of slavery. 
You cannot get yourself free. You're enslaved. Have you seen that that's your only hope to whatever it is you're stuck in? Or do you think this new teacher, this new guru, this new technique, that'll fix it. That'll buy me my freedom. Are you still deluded into thinking that you can save yourself, that you can free yourself, or even to thinking that I can free others? Slaves aren't saved by working hard. They're saved by being set free. Jesus frees. That's what he said he came to do. He said, those who the sun sets free will be free indeed. The book of Galatians says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, stop going back to the things that enslave you. And what did Jesus use to buy your freedom? He didn't use silver and gold. He didn't go to a market and pay. He bought you with his own blood. That's what 1 Peter says. It says, you were purchased not with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. And this is where we're going to pause. Because the Holy Spirit wants to set you free today, wants you to know a new level of freedom. I was reminded in the first service that about this time last year, I was talking to a Christian friend who's a counsellor, and she was speaking truth over me, reminding me that my father loves me. But I couldn't hear it because I was enslaved to some lies. And and actually, as we were talking, I was just, I couldn't control myself for the emotion. I was so broken. And I knew underneath it was this. I didn't believe that I had any more freedom available to me. I thought, this is the limit. I'll just have to live in grey for the rest of it. But as she spoke truth and reminded me that I was listening to lies, I claimed and took hold of the freedom that Christ took hold of me for. And he wants the same for you. We're gonna, if you're able to, I'm going to ask you to stand because I think it helps us become active in our response. Why don't you stand with me now and we're going to pray that prayer again that we started our sermon with this morning. We're going to use this as a way of asking God, what is it that you're, what am I enslaved to? What do I need to be free from? And even to confess to God, I cannot free myself. Let's pray this together. Father, Please free me, please save me, please know me. And we ask Holy Spirit, come. Come and set people free. we stand to maybe picture yourself with some chains and ask the Lord, what is it that I'm enslaved to? And confess, I cannot save myself. Please free me. Jesus died so that you would be free and free indeed. Not half free, not a little bit free, but free indeed. There is more freedom for you. If you've never come to Christ, this is what he comes for, to you for. It's not to make you more moral but to free you because you cannot save yourself. Return to God.
whatever it is you go to, you don't need that to mend your heart. He will do it. Admit, I'm a slave. I need saving. I cannot save myself. And receive the grace of God from you. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed. After Hosea redeemed his wife and says that he taught her to live differently again. He removed from her her slavery and then trained her to live differently. The Lord sets you free, but then he invites you to learn to live free. He wants to teach you to live free. The first step of living free is being free. And so as we're standing here again, what is it the Lord's telling you to put down? You don't need to carry that anymore. For some, I feel the Lord was saying, you put a glass ceiling on your life. 
that I've not put there. You've said this much and no further, this much freedom and no more. He didn't put that there. He's come to give you total freedom to know you're a dearly loved son and daughter with a purpose to bring God's kingdom on the earth. Amen. Amen. Perhaps you can grab your seat. So that's, that's part one. Now, more briefly, I want to look at the second oddity of the passage. See what you thought of this. Maybe it stood out to you as we read it. We talked about redemption. Let's talk about raisins. I mean, what's with this? In the verse before, actually, the one we looked at, it says, Yahweh loves the children of Israel, though they often turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. What's God got against Welsh cakes or malt loaf? Why bring that up? I mean, devoted to other gods. Okay, I can understand why you'd be annoyed at that, but hot cross buns? In ancient Israel, cakes of raisins were a rare delicacy. It was something that was often associated with festivals and special occasions. Sometimes they were associated with occasions of worshipping false gods, but a lot of the time they were just for feasting. It comes up in the Song of Songs. Let's be refreshed with cakes of raisins because it's a wedding thing. They were for national holidays, like afternoon tea or cream and strawberries and scones or Prosecco and Pims or Christmas turkey, which you can only have at Christmas. If you have that all year round, if you eat turkey throughout the year, there's something slightly wrong with you. It's only for Christmas Day because it's not that nice. But the point, the point of mentioning the raisin cakes here is to turn up the contrast. God is devoted to his wife. He adores his people. He promises to be with them, commit to them, their entire live long lives. But she just fancies a raisin cake. <laughs> the contrast is stark. It reveals the contempt with which they treat God and they treat his love and his affections. What they're doing may not be as high-handed as worshipping other gods, as sinning deliberately. But nevertheless, they've got a very cool heart towards him. He, I mean, God seems so distant, abstract, remote, far away. But food, chocolate, that's tasteable. That's nourishing. I know what to do with that. I don't know how to do the God stuff. And in one sense, I can understand that. I think it's easy it's easy to get excited and carried away at a football match. Say when your son is playing in a six-a-side six tournament, and they may have said in the rules, parents, remember, this is just a game. They may have said that, but you know it's a matter of life and death when your kid's on the pitch and then well, they just kick the ball. You know I'm that parent. Or you know when you're watching teams compete, you know it doesn't mean anything. But at the same time, it feels like it really means something. Because you can see it. You can see with your eyes who's winning and losing. And I think that's why it's very easy for people to express all kinds of emotion in a football stadium that those same people would be shut up tight in church. Nothing worth shouting about in church, is there? Nothing to get excited about. No one's winning. No one's losing. Maybe you can identify with what one person said when she said, um, I find it hard because God may be in my ears in audio form, but the world around me is in audiovisual. There's so many different things, sights and sounds and smells and tastes, whereas I just go to church and I just get people talking into my ears. Maybe you can relate to that. See, that's the thing with idolatry. It's why our hearts go there. Because it's easy to make a physical image. You can see it, you can touch it, you can see it, and you can bow down to it. It's easier to do that than it is to think, well, where is God? All around me? What does that mean? How do I get near to him? And so we make idols and images and we bow down to those things or we devote our things to physical things that we can see, taste and touch. And we forget all the time that those things are impotent. They're unable to give us life. They just take our time, our energy, our money. And then we wake up one day and think, my life is gone and I've got nothing to show. I devoted myself to something that's left me only with an aching emptiness inside. See, God's problem isn't with raisin cakes 
or anything else in all of creation. Instead, the issue is with his people's disordered loves. Not only does his people, Israel, the, the wife in the story, not only does she love other men or worship other gods, but she'd even prefer stolen cake to her husband. That's how low things have got. And the great North African philosopher from the fourth century, a man named St. Augustine, he saw this as being at the root of humanity's problem. He said, our real problem is one to do with disordered loves. Because he said, when we love something more it, when we love something more than we love God, we, do, we both do wrong to God and we do harm to ourselves. When I love something in this world more than I love God, I'm doing God a disservice, but I'm also injuring myself. Explaining this, author Tim Keller says, if you love your children more than you love God, you'll essentially rest your need for significance and security in your children. You will need too much for them to succeed You'll, and for you to be happy and to, they'll, you'll need them to love you. That will either drive them away or it will crush them under the weight of your own expectations because they will be the ultimate source of your happiness and no human being can measure up to that. If instead you love your spouse or romantic partner more than you love God, the same thing occurs. If you love your work and career more than you love God, you will necessarily also love them more than your family, your community, and even your own health that will lead to physical and relational breakdown and often to social injustice. Disordered loves. The issue isn't to care less about raisin cakes or about the things in the world or to care less about your friends, your family, your wife. The issue is to put them in the right proportion, to learn to love them for his sake. Let me explain. The author, um, Paul Bloom, in his book, How Pleasure Works, he argues that what matters for pleasure isn't the impact that a thing has on our senses. What matters for pleasure is what it means in relationship to other people who matter to us. So it, the pleasure of having a barbecue alone is a lot less than having a barbecue with others. That's the point. A chair may be comfortable, may give you pleasure to sit in, but if that chair just happened to be our mother's favorite chair that she used to sit in all the day and now we've got it, when we sit in it, our pleasure's increased. I have a picture at home in my office that was drawn for me by my dad before he died. And it's, as far as works of art go, it's okay. I've got lots of other pictures in my house that are more impressive artistically than this. But that one means far more to me than all the others combined. Because that one is a window into my relationship with him. It mediates his presence. To use theological language, we enjoy things most when we experience them as a sacrament. That is, as something that carries the presence of another to us. That's how we ultimately learn to get God on video. We reorder our loves so that the love of the world, we love the world as something that carries to us the presence of God and makes God real to our senses. There's a great hymn that brings this home to us. I won't sing it, but the lyrics go like this. It says, this is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Do you hear the music? This is my father's world. I rest in this thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand, the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. He shines in all that is fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Do you hear it? Do you receive the world and the people around you as carriers of the presence of God? Do you hear God in the laughter of children? Do you see the love of God in the care or devotion of a spouse or a parent toward their child? Can you hear God or see God in the sunrise or in the colors around us? They are supposed to be things that make God's presence real to you. They are a sacrament for us. That's why a lot of the emphasis on creation care is a dead end in and of itself. I don't want to, I'm not motivated to steward the planet for the planet's sake or even for my children's sake, but for my father's sake because this world is his and it speaks to me of him. And so I'm to care for the things that he has given me and made real for me. He turns even the most boring and drudgerous thing into something 
splendid and remarkable. And actually, when he died, Jesus did something similar to us. He took some bread and some wine, and he said, this bread is my body broken for you. This wine is the cup of my blood poured out for you. Eat, drink, do this in remembrance of me. And so these things, these physical things, become carriers of the presence of God for us. So go ahead. Love your raisin cakes, your hot cross buns, your Welsh cakes, your stolen cakes. I don't know any other things made of raisins. I'm sure there's lots. Love them, enjoy them, but only as in proportion to the fact that they allow you and enable you to know and love God more. We're going to use this image of the created world to help us now as we take communion and we draw near to God by using the meal that Jesus has given us. So perhaps our Connect team can come and pass that round. And if you're a Christian, then this is for you. This is Jesus' gift as a way of saying, take, eat, drink, do this in remembrance of me, as part of me. If you're not yet a Christian, you can just let this pass you by. And you can today come to God and say, free me, Jesus, free me, love me, lead me, and enable me to take this meal as a reminder of what you've done for me. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As we eat and as we drink this, we return to the lover of our souls. We return to God. We order our loves and we receive what he's given us as a window into his presence and his goodness towards us. As we eat and drink this, we're effectively saying, I want to come home. And as it nourishes our hunger and our thirst, so we're reminded that God alleviates and takes away and meets all of the needs that we have in life. We'll just allow the Connect team to finish passing it around and then we'll take it together as one. Because though we are many, we are one family, all of us dining around the same table, feasting on Jesus together. Father, we thank you for your loving goodness. We thank you that you've met our needs. Lord, we confess that we so often don't love you as we should. I so often love the things in this world as though it's this world that really counts. And I ignore you and disregard you. We confess our sin. We confess our need for you. Let's take the bread together. Body of Christ broken for you. We'll take the cup, the blood of Christ poured out for you. stand and sing together as we respond.